Um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, uh, I feel. Hold off on all the filming questions. Okay. Do the combined Q&A, because I think that's what we should do. If you want to ask some general you know, questions about the company or about space travel or whatever, um, let's get those out of the way, and then you know, we'll do his presentation, and then Steve, and then we can get them both on and talk about filming in space and that topic. Absolutely. And let, let me jump to some, some uh, new additional videos that I've got. So this is, our, this is our big rocket, the Falcon 9 that I was talking about that we aspire to make uh, fully reusable. This is the first stage firing of the Falcon 9. So this is a, almost a, a million pounds of thrust in vacuum, which is about four times the maximum thrust of a 747. And uh, it's pretty much all the, it's Armageddon down there. Uh, you don't want to be standing at the base of that uh, test stand. Tell them how tall the test stand is. Give them scale. Um, sure, the test stand is a uh, couple of hundred feet. Well, the test stand itself is like 130 feet tall, and then there's about a 100 foot tall stage on top of it. So it's like 230 or 240 feet approximately to the top. Um, and now I'll jump into, so this is like intended for Congress, that's why it's got this music. <laughs> Falcon 9 will launch from our pad at Cape Canaveral. That's uh, launch pad 40 at Cape Canaveral, which uh, used to house the Titan IV. Now, this is not real, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is a simulation. So, so the contract SpaceX has right now is to demonstrate cargo transfer to the space station and return of experiments to Earth. Um, and what we're hoping NASA will exercise is an option on that contract to also carry astronauts. Um, and uh, I think they will exercise that option fairly soon. Um, People or yeah, but I mean, I know you're people, but I'm just wondering if you're science or whatever, how much weight you think you're supposed to have right now. Well, Falcon 9 can carry about uh, roughly 11 to 12 tons to orbit, um, and then with, in our Dragon spacecraft, uh, we can carry seven people. So we're the same number of people as the space shuttle carry, but of course we don't have the giant cargo bay. So. Um, Uh, the, the, the manned portion? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's about, it's, NASA can exercise it right now. Um, th there isn't currently uh, funds, there aren't currently funds appropriated for what's called COTS D, which COTS is Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, uh, option D, which is manned. Uh, but in the stimulus bill that's being crafted, we're hopeful that there will be a portion of the stimulus bill that will include uh, money for COTS D. How big is your legal team? <laughs> 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 like three lawyers. Um, SpaceX as a whole is 600 people. Has the legal red tape been daunting? Or? There's quite a lot of legal, yeah, a lot of legal red tape. There's also a lot of uh, regulatory uh, stuff that has to, which isn't done by the lawyers. It's just it's done by the engineers who have to comply with the, the regulations. Um, because in order for us to go to the space station, we have to meet the same regulatory requirements that the space shuttle uh, does, or that the Europeans, or, or, or actually more than the Russians do. <laughs> the Russians are all. <laughs> They have their own rules. What, uh, how, how much do you draw upon the existing or retired NASA engineers? Um, we, we have actually a lot of people at SpaceX that, that used to work at NASA or JPL. Um, so I'm not sure the exact percentage, but it's you know, five, maybe 5 to 10% of our engineers. Um, 
We also hire a lot of people straight out of school and from also from you know the big airspace companies and from companies that are not in the space arena. Um, yeah, Virgin, um, France is a, a friend of mine and I've actually bought a ticket on Virgin Galactic. Um, people often think we're competing, but, but that's not the case because Virgin is really just going to space. To, they're doing suborbital flights. So the energy of the Virgin ship is only, it's less than 2% of the energy of our vehicle. What's your opinion on elevators in space? Is that realistic? Um, you know, I always liked Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, <laughs> I think that's where the idea comes from. Um, I do, yeah. No, it basically. <laughs> yeah, so the space elevated idea is you have this um, really long cable. By really long, I mean it's sort of like anywhere from 40 to 60,000 miles long. Um, <laughs> And, and it's uh, with the ends way out in space and the, the base is on the Earth. And you can imagine, like, the Earth is this ball rotating and you've got this, like, cable trailing, you know, out and it's sort of, you know. Um, the, there are a lot of issues with the space elevator. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of issues. And, I mean, this is, uh, it, it also does rely on, on super strong materials, uh, carbon nanotubes. Um, and, you know, until we build, say, a carbon nanotube to footbridge, um, then I think we should not really be thinking too much about building a 60,000 mile uh, elevator. Um, and it's possible that somebody may figure out how to, how to do it, a space elevator and make it workable at some point in the future, but there's got to be a huge amount of business going to space before that's, that's feasible. And then of course you get to the end of the elevator, but then, that's, then you've got to go somewhere from there. So there's got to be a spacecraft that picks you up at the end of the, at the, end of the elevator anyway. So the elevator is just sort of getting you out of that, that initial portion of gravity wave. It's, it's not, you know, not this century. <laughs> Are there any fuel options that are greener than the kerosene mix that you're using right now? Um, well, <clears throat> the, you, know, you, you could use hydrogen uh, and oxygen. Um, that's, that's not a bad choice. Um, Although, you know, typically the energy required to create the hydrogen is, is more energy than was used to get the, the kerosene. Um, so, but if you, in principle, if you were to make hydrogen with solar panels, that would be a greener way to do it. Um, but it's, it's, although we, you know, rocket, the rocket's pretty big and whatnot, it's, it's actually only good about the kerosene load of, of an airliner. Um, because two thirds of the rocket is actually oxidizer; it's liquid oxygen. Um, so that's it's, it's you know think of it like it's an airline flight. Do you have any plans to create something that combines your interest in solar energy and collection of solar energy on the rockets and the orbits? You mean like space solar power? <laughs> you know, if, if there's anyone in the world who should love space solar, space solar power, it's me. Yeah. Um, because I'm chairman and the largest shareholder of a, of a solar company called yeah. Solar City, um, and I've a rocket company. So it's going to be like perfect. Um, That's why I'm asking. Unfortunately, I think, don't think space solar power is, it ma makes sense. I wish it did, because that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but it, 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 the, you know, it, even if you assume it costs zero to transport the solar panels to space, when you take into account the equipment that's necessary to convert the the, the energy to, um, say, microwaves or some other beamed, beam form of energy, and then you've got to have equipment on the ground that converts the microwaves back to electricity. Uh, just when you take that capital cost into account, you're immediately blown out of the water, and it's not competitive with, with terrestrial solar power. Mm -hmm. So there's no point in even thinking about it. How far behind are we from uh, other countries? Is anybody else doing it? Uh, with, with, with SpaceX, um, well, um, the, the, the Chinese are, ha, have a pretty interesting manned space program. I mean, right now, there's, there's really just the, the Chinese, the Russians, and the U.S. that send people to orbit. Um, and the, the space shuttle is re retiring in 2010, so unless, unless our craft is active, the U.S. will not have the ability to send people to orbit. Um, there is a longer-term program that NASA's got called the Ares Orion uh, pro project, which is due to be finished around 2015 or 2016, 
Um, and that's intended to be part of a system that takes us back to the moon. But for about five or six years there, unless SpaceX is successful, there will be no American manned space capability. Um, so there'll just be the Russians who are charging us crazy. Right now, you see, the, 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 this is just really awful. The, the Russians are charging us uh, over $70 million per seat to go to the, after, the, after the shuttle retires. I mean, they've, they, they got us over a battle run and they're doing us hard. I mean, it's really rough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll spend half a billion dollars per year on, on the Russians just buying uh, tickets for uh, six astronauts, six or seven astronauts to go to the space station per year. Uh, but if, if we're, you know, if we're ready in time, and I think we can be, uh, then, uh, you know, that, that won't happen. Um, our cost per, per person, even with assuming no reusability, assuming that every bit of it is expended and no refurbishment or reusability, uh, is about 15 million per, per person. And it's U.S. and, you know, the jobs are here and all that sort of stuff. So I think it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, but no-brainers in Washington, D.C. don't always, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, well, what happened in the response from Congress? Uh, the, generally, uh, generally enthusiastic, but the, the, well, there's, yeah, I mean, it, I don't know. Um, the, the, you know, Hollywood have an amazing way of saying no money. There's like so many different words, but really, is, they haven't given you any money? Well, they, we, we've been given money for the cargo portion, but not the, not the, not for the man portion. Um, and, uh, but I, I, you know, I'm hopeful, like I said, that the stimulus bill will actually include the funds for the, the manned spaceflight uh, activity. If it's not in this, in the stimulus bill, I think it's quite likely that it'll be in the financial year uh, FIO 10 bill, uh, which is, will get approved around the February or March time frame. Um, so the, the government financial year um, starts in October. Uh, so, um, so I'm, I'm not going to say it's going to happen. It's just a question of what time scale. And for every year that we're dependent on the Russians, we, we have to send them half a billion dollars. So, and, and the amount that we're asking for to get this done is three hundred million dollars. So, <coughs> I don't know, just, it seems kind of ludicrous. But um, anyway, that's DC. Um, yeah. So you, you, you've never done, you've never had a mission go up. Is it the same? You have had. Missions? Um, we've done our, our Falcon 1, which is our small, our small rocket. Right. We'll be doing our first launch of our big rocket with our Dragon spacecraft uh, next year. And that, uh, there'll be two flights next year. One's a demonstration flight and one, one's a, a NASA flight. Uh, and then there are two more NASA flights after that. And then there's people in those or no? No, because we've not had the, 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 the crew portion of our contract has not been turned on. Okay. So you're saying you, you're hoping to get the 300 million to be able to... Yeah, to basically add the incremental crew capability, and most of that money is for demonstrating the system reliability. Once you have the technology figured out, what prevents you from having, I don't know, 10 launches? Uh, well, 10 launches a day would be super fast for all for, for the rockets. <laughs> well, uh, but just using it but you, scale. We, need, we do need to get to the point where we can do 10 launches a day. Um, and one of the design goals for Falcon 9 is that it can go from in the hangar to in the air in under 60 minutes which would be super, super fast for a, a rocket, particularly a big rocket. Um, now, it's going to take several flights before we get there, but as long as we lay, lay the, the, the foundation, making sure that the design is capable of that, th then we can at least have the, uh, the possibility of getting to you know, a flight an hour or, or, or so um, in the future. Is your cargo and telecommunications satellites or delivering to the space station? Um, well, for, for NASA, um, our current NASA missions are just for delivery of cargo to the space station and return of experiments to Earth. Um, for Falcon 9, uh, there's just the, so there's Falcon 9 booster and then there's a Dragon spacecraft. Dragon spacecraft goes to the space station. Um, a Falcon 9 booster carries satellites, and it'll, it'll do um, Earth observation satellites, uh, and it'll do uh, communication satellites, broadcast satellites, that kind of thing. Um, so we're launching. Um, a UK broadcast satellite uh, towards the end of next year, a geostationary satellite. Um, so that, that really goes pretty far out there, 22,000 miles altitude. Um, are there sort of developing issues about who controls and manages satellites and sort of the international implications of that and our military? Um, yeah, so there's a few questions bound up there. Um, like who, who controls the satellites? Uh, the satellites generally are, if, if a satellite is broadcasting, um, then the, that broadcast spectrum is controlled by the International Telecommunications Union. So that's 
kind of a UN body, I think. Um, yeah, you have to get permission from the ITU to get uh, broadcast, to get bandwidth. Um, to just go up there, all you need is permission from your national government. And um, in the US, if it's a com commercial or non-government mission, the FAA, the FAA governs it. If it's a military mission, the military does what they, whatever they want. Um, <laughs> and then if it's NASA, NASA does whatever they want. Who regulates all that? There really isn't a global, the only global regulatory authority is the International Tele Telecommunications Union. Um, and that just governs spectrum. Yeah. Well, um, that's a good question because that sets the minimum cost of a, of a mission. Right. If you had perfect uh, refurbishment and uh, had no operations cost, the the the, the, the fuel and uh, and oxidizer cost is, is, is really super low. Um, it's for our big rocket, it's only a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, for our small rocket, it's about thirty or forty thousand um, dollars. So it's if you just look at the propellant cost, it's very very cheap. I wouldn't say going down, uh, but uh, yeah, I think the, the cost of kerosene, which is you know kind of jet fuel, is going to go up over time. But I think it's not going to be a big factor for rocket launch costs. Uh, and the cost of liquid oxygen is just really the cost of electricity, because you can just com compress and liquefy air. Um, so. All right. Well, I, th yeah. I think that's it. So thank you very much. All right, so we're going to have a quick, quick, quick break. And if anybody, if you guys want to try and find seats, now would be a good time. All right, for bathrooms, if anybody needs a restroom, there's one in the pool house. So you go outside this uh, glass door and then into the back, and it's right there. And then there's one in the front if you need it. <laughs>